if you take advice from people who are not living in the circumstances that you yourself would like to be living in, chances are you're gonna end up in the exact same position that those people are in. And if you don't wanna be like them, quit listening to them. I have been in the car business for 23 years, as we have discussed in great length. I've been doing finance for a decade. I have a mortgage license. I literally eat, breathe, and sleep credit reports and finance and market trends specifically designed for this business and to be able to help consumers like you to be able to navigate an ever-changing market and and to be able to do it confidently and that is the exact reason why this podcast was created so if this sounds like you if you are that person who is afraid to even look at your credit because you don't know what is there and you need to buy a car and all of the advice that you are getting sounds like absolute nonsense there's a real possibility that that advice is absolute nonsense and nobody wants to have to do anything when they're not prepared and they get smacked in the side of their head with a harsh dose of reality that they just weren't prepared for. If that sounds like you, then stick with me. In this video specifically, we're going to talk about how to know what's in your credit without even looking at your credit profile. We're going to talk about what you need to do to be confident to walk into a dealership knowing that you're going to be able to buy a car because you are prepared. You are well equipped with all of the things. I'm going to literally give them all to you. Just break out your notepad, pay attention, and let's go. You're listening to the Auto Advice Podcast. Brought to you by Toyota of Cool Springs. Hey guys, welcome back to the Auto Advice Podcast. Most of you already know me. I'm Ashley Calderon, otherwise known as that F&I lady. I am your co-host for this wonderful series, and today we thought it would be appropriate to have a conversation, if you will, about a very unique challenge that most of Americans are facing currently, and that is trying to buy a car when you've got less than stellar credit. So we figured we would sit down and talk about it. Maybe you guys can grab a cup of coffee or a juice or a glass of wine and a notebook, maybe take some notes and figure out how you can be best prepared to enter into the car buying market, if you will, with the challenges that we're currently facing. We've got interest rates that have been on the rise for the last three years and there's no sign of that slowing down anytime soon. So come hang out with us for a little while and maybe get better prepared for what you're going to have to embark on at some point in time. So first things first, I want to talk about realistically what you should be expecting when you're walking into a dealership. And one of the things that we face here as finance managers is that we have a lot of customers that come in that don't actually have a realistic understanding or view of what their credit actually is. So a lot of that comes from being misinformed or just not really being educated. There are obviously people that are going to come in here and just not really give an idealistic picture of what their credit actually looks like. And some of you just don't know. So let's talk about really what good credit is, right? So there's a lot of people that don't understand that credit karma, and this is something that we've talked about in the past, even for our first time buyers episode, and we'll go ahead and link that up here for you. But having good credit is not necessarily just a score, right? There's people who have really high scores and that just don't really have a whole lot of content to their credit itself. And so they come in and they get discouraged when they're smacked around with first time buyer interest rates. And then there are people that don't really have the best score, but have a very, very in-depth credit profile. And there's a whole lot for the banks to take into consideration when they're trying to determine whether or not they can extend credit to you. So it's very, very important that you have a realistic understanding of what your credit profile is and that you're both both honest with yourself about it and that you're honest with the dealership personnel about it because part of the process when you're buying a car is to not only pick out a car, but you're going to explain to your salesperson, they're going to ask you at some point in time, hey, what does your credit look like? And a lot of people are going to say, oh, I've got good credit, but do you? When when your salesperson takes that information to the sales desk with the intention of bringing numbers out for you to look at, and they're going to hand you a piece of paper and it's going to have you know, multiple financing terms on it, 60, 72, 84 months, whatever the case may be, depends on what you're purchasing. We're going to base those estimates on your car payments on what you tell us your credit looks like. So you've got a couple of tools at your disposal. Most of these things are apps. You 
can get them on your phone. Some of them are free. Some of them you do have to pay for. One of my personal favorites is Experian because it is free to consumers. There's options on it that you can pay for, but then there's also the My FICO app. It usually runs somewhere in the ballpark about 30 bucks a month, but it's going to give you your actual FICO scores. My FICO specifically is going to give you all three versions or all three bureaus rather with there's probably nine different versions of your credit that are all weighted specifically for the type of credit that you're trying to get. But in general, some things to take into consideration if you don't necessarily have access to go on the websites or to download these apps and whatnot. So student loans are absolutely reported to your credit bureau. When you take out those loans, whether you're currently in school, you're paying on them, or you've been paying on them, they're always reported. So while you're in school, those are reported as just being paid. But most of your lenders know that you're not actually making payments on them, but it can help. It's going to help at least generate a score for you. People don't take into consideration medical debts. So if you've ever been to the emergency room or you've gone to see a doctor and you didn't pay the bill in its entirety, you sign a form that says that you understand that you are financially responsible for any portion of it that your insurance company doesn't pay or that you understand that you're responsible for it in general if you just don't have insurance. Unpaid rent, your Verizon phone bill, AT&T, all those creditors that you don't necessarily consider as, as credit because it's not a credit card, it's not necessarily money that you're borrowing. Any of those institutions that you maybe don't pay on time, if you leave them with a balance, they're going to report it on your credit bureau. So those are things to keep in mind. If you've ever had a loan or a credit card and you've made those payments late in any capacity, especially if they're over 30 days late, those are going to be reflected on your credit bureau. It's typically reflected for about seven years. Good information they'll try to keep on your credit bureau for a little bit longer, but any time that you know in the back of your head when you're shopping for something that you've not necessarily paid it exactly as the terms were outlined in your contract or in your agreement, those are things that you may want to say, you know, maybe I haven't paid everything exactly the way that I was supposed to. And that's a really good opportunity for you to tell your salesperson, hey, you know, like, I don't think my credit is bad, but yeah, I've had some hiccups here and there. It's a pretty good indicator for us that maybe we need to actually pull your credit and look at it to get a better idea of, of what the banks are going to come back with as far as an answer, just so that when you do get into the finance office and, and you've got this idea of what your car payments are supposed to be, you don't come back here and you get smacked over the head with a car payment that's $200 higher than what you anticipated it to be, just because the interest rate is so darkly different from, from what the sales managers were trying to figure it out to actually be. You know, most of these situations don't necessarily mean that you're not going to be able to purchase a car. It just means that there's a little bit more legwork involved in it and it's a more lengthy process. So another thing to take into consideration is that if this sounds like it's you, probably not the best idea to go to a dealership, you know, an hour before they close or especially like on the weekends at 6, 30, 7 o'clock at night, even though some of us are open till eight or nine here at Toyota Cool Springs. We close at seven o'clock, but a lot of those banks close rather early. And a lot of these are situations where when we do start working on your loan and we do start getting you submitted to these banks, we have to pick up the phone and we rely on our relationships with these lenders to kind of explain to them what your individual situation looks like. And then we can kind of negotiate on your behalf in order to get you the best terms. Setting realistic expectations for yourself is, is also a really, really important factor. You know, before COVID hit, we were seeing interest rates for well-qualified buyers that were, gosh, as low as 2 and 3% for 84 months on a good equity deal, right? And now those same buyers are paying 8 to 10% on the exact same loan. So where we've had these traditionally really, really low interest rates for the better of a decade, now all of a sudden we're paying three and four times what the rates are. So for somebody who is credit challenged, you're going from a situation where you were originally paying 10, 12, maybe 13% on a loan for even somebody who doesn't have the best credit. Now that same buyer is in the high teens. You're talking 16 to sometimes even in the 20% range, which can be a very, very difficult pill to swallow. You you go from a very, very different range of affordability as far as your cars are concerned. That same $15,000 loan that would have run a $400 car payment three years ago is now a $500 car payment just because the interest rate is very, very different. So that's something to also take into consideration. You 
do also have to remember that if you are what's considered subprime or even secondary, and for clarification purposes, subprime is really considered anybody who has a credit score that is likely under about 680. They range, as far as the carbine is concerned, your FICO scores range from, I have seen them as low as the 300s, and I have seen a 900 credit score twice in the 23 years that I've done this. We call those unicorns in this business because they don't really exist very often, but anything under about a 680 is gonna be considered subprime, and then below about a 620 is gonna be considered secondary. So your secondary credit, you're gonna definitely have a lot more stipulations from the bank. High likelihood that you're gonna have to be able to prove your income. They're gonna wanna verify your employment. They're gonna want proof of residence, especially if your driver's license doesn't match. Your payment to income guidelines are gonna be much, much stricter. They're going to want to do a an interview with you before they fund your contract, which is what's required in order for us to send your paperwork off to your county clerk's office, get it registered to you. So there's a lot of things that you're going to want to have readily available to you when you walk into the dealership. Another thing that you're going to want to make sure that you're prepared for is lenders are going to expect some sort of participation, if you will, on your end. So we're talking down payments that are in excess of 10% of the purchase price of the vehicle. A lot of these lenders require a minimum of a thousand dollar down payment. If you're trying to purchase something that's more expensive or even a used vehicle, you're going to have to take into consideration that it's probably going to be a much bigger down payment because they like to be in an equity position anytime that they're dealing with something that is a higher risk to them. And if your credit profile shows that you haven't always paid all of your obligations exactly as you've agreed to, you are considered more high risk and your interest rates are going to be indicative of that risk. We do have a significant number of people, not so much in this market here because Williamson County is largely considered one of the wealthiest counties in the country, but there are a significant number of people that have been through bankruptcy or are currently going through bankruptcy. And that situation in and of itself presents its own challenges. People that are in a chapter 13 bankruptcy actively, for instance, you need a letter from your trustee that says exactly how much money you can borrow, what your maximum term is, they specify what interest rate you're allowed to pay, how much money you're allowed to put down, and there's really only two or three banks that that will even entertain going into that situation. A lot of people have filed for Chapter 13 bankruptcy and they don't complete it. It's considered a dismissal of a Chapter 13 bankruptcy. Most lenders want won't even entertain financing for somebody who has a dismissed Chapter 13 bankruptcy. And it's because you can add to your debt and then turn around and pick it right back up and now they're included in it. So they get, you know, that's the baby tossed out with the, with the bathwater. Now, Chapter 7 bankruptcy is a little bit easier to deal with. It's a, it's a complete elimination of pretty much everything but your student loans, but they're discharged quickly. You don't need anybody's permission in order to start rebuilding your credit, but most of the lenders are gonna wanna see some reestablishment of of a payment history before they do entertain loaning you money to buy a car. People who've had repossessions, does it mean you can't buy a car? No, I mean, I can count probably need all of my fingers and toes to count the number of people that I've put in cars that have had vehicles repossessed. It is definitely worth noting though, and I don't care who told you, your mama, your grandmama, an attorney, your neighbor, your best friend, I don't care if it was your financial advisor, a repossession is a repossession no matter which way you spin it. It doesn't matter if it was voluntary or involuntary, meaning that you decided you couldn't make the payments and you called them and told them to come and get the car, or involuntary where you couldn't make the payments and they had to come find it and track it down and haul it off, it's a repo. You had a vehicle that you couldn't pay for and they had to come and get their collateral and now it's sitting on your credit report that they sent it to auction and they have sued you for the remaining balance. Those are situations that are very unique. If it's something that's recent, you need to be prepared to have a very well-qualified co-buyer, a substantial down payment, and there's a high likelihood that the lending institution is not going to lend you more money than what you just had repossessed. They're definitely not going to give you a car payment that's higher than the one that got repossessed. They want to see you back in a situation that they're comfortable that you're going to be able to actually fulfill your obligations to them. If you've had a repossession and 
it's been a couple of years and you've been well reestablished in those last couple of years, you may not always need to have a co-buyer involved in it. You just need to be able to prove and show that your credit has changed and that you've matured financially. And, and most of the time, they're going to give you a fair shot, especially if your scores come up significantly. Those of you who are going through or have been through bankruptcy and you had a car payment when you filed, if you reaffirmed that debt and you kept paying your car payment, your chances of being able to turn around and buy another car almost immediately after bankruptcy have just increased exponentially because the lenders recognize that you kept paying your car payment and that was the one thing that you didn't want to take down. And most of these lenders appreciate not being taken to the cleaners in the event of a bankruptcy. Nobody actually likes getting back their collateral. So interest rates obviously are going to be something that you know, we, we kind of touched on having a higher interest rate if you're if you're subprime, right, and what those interest rates used to look like. One of the biggest things that we've been dealing with over the last couple of years is, in addition to just the interest rates going up, is the incentivized rates changing. We used to have 0%, 0.9, 1.9, 2.9, and all these numbers that were crazy and chaotic. We're just lending money like it's nobody's business. And now even the incentivized rates are typically higher than what standard rates were when you were getting the 0% incentivized rates. As a result of that, everything is just more expensive. You've got a lot of lenders and a lot of brands even that they're going to push out these incentivized interest rates because there's certain cars that they need to be able to get rid of. I have a lot of customers that come in and they've got this idea of what they'd like to be able to buy and it's something that's more expensive. You've got, you know, some of our anchor vehicles, if you will, like your Forerunners and Sequoias and Grand Highlanders or anything that's just come out there's not really any incentives on those vehicles. And so it's something to take into consideration also when you're in a, a less than ideal credit situation. And can you afford the vehicle that you're really trying to buy? And does it make sense for you to buy something that's that expensive at the interest rate that you're probably going to have when realistically you can buy something that's going to be a little bit less expensive, kind of rebuild your credit situation, and then come back in a year or two when you've got some clout, right, with these lending institutions and then you can really dive into it you can buy exactly what you want to buy you just need to take the steps in order to get there I've been there you know I, I think that most of Americans have because unfortunately our education system isn't set up to teach us how to get good credit how to maintain good credit why we pay our bills there's a hundred and one how-to books that are out there on how to just eliminate your debt entirely but in all reality that doesn't make sense sense for the majority of Americans. Most of us are not in a position where we can pay off all of our credit card debt and pay off our house and pay off our cars and and drive something that is in constant need of repairs just so that we can throw our money at, at being completely debt free, it's more important to learn how to responsibly use your credit. It doesn't make sense to me or to anybody in this business in reality why there's not programs that are out there to help you learn how to manage your credit, how to use it responsibly. And in doing so, you, you set yourself up to be able to do more later on down the road without paying astronomical interest rates. If you're capable of paying your bills and you're trying to pay your bills, you shouldn't have to pay thousands upon thousands of dollars more than the guy right next to you to buy the exact same thing in the exact same terms just because somebody didn't tell you that, you know, you got to pay your stuff on time. Late fees, things like that. A lot of people don't take into consideration that if you pay a credit card payment or your house payment or whatever payment it is and you make it 10 days late, it's most of the leeway with most lenders, that they're going hit you with a late fee. And if you don't pay that payment plus the late fee, a lot of these institutions are going to roll that late fee and call it an actual late payment as if the entire thing is late. And people don't recognize it until they walk into a place to buy something and they realize that their credit scores dropped 120 points from what it used to be because you didn't catch that there was a late fee on something. Just because it wasn't 30 days late doesn't mean that they're not going to carry over that late fee. So it's really, really important to kind 
kind of stay on top of what it is that you're paying and when those things are due, because there's obviously consequences that most people don't even consider. One of the things to consider if if this is your situation, right? I mean, obviously you, you knew in the first five minutes of this video, whether or not I was talking to you or I was talking to your neighbor or somebody that you might be friends with. And absolutely, you should tell them to watch this video because that's what this entire podcast is about, trying to give you the information that you need in order to navigate a system that was not designed to be the most consumer friendly, right? Nobody actually likes buying a car. Uh, I mean, you do almost be a special kind of psychopath present party is not excluded to just enjoy going and spending money the way that that you do when you're buying a car. It's scary. And when you don't know what the answer is going to be when you walk into a car dealership, especially if you know that you're kind of on shaky ground, it's scary and it's intimidating and it gives anxiety. And I get people in here all the time that they're like, I'll sign these papers. I just need to know if I'm going to be approved. One of the biggest things to consider though here at a Toyota dealership is why should you buy a Toyota if you don't have the best credit? I think there's a very simple answer to that. Toyota and owning a Toyota, especially if you're trying to rebuild your credit situation, when you need something that's reliable, Toyota is like that ride or die best friend that you've got. And you know the one that I'm talking about. It, it's the one that you can call at two o'clock in the morning and they don't ask any questions. They know you're already in the driveway. You want to take an absolutely insane road trip that makes no sense. And they say, sure, just let me throw my pants on and I'll be out there in a second. They don't even ask any questions. Okay, that's what owning a Toyota is like. You have something that you know it's reliable. It's dependable. It's going to get you where you need to be when you need to be there. It's not really going to give you a whole lot of problems. Statistically speaking, and this comes from years in finance, and even after being a warranty administrator for many years, it, it costs less to even put extended service contracts on a Toyota. And it's not so much that they don't break. It's, it's not so much that it doesn't cost a lot of money if they break. It's just that most people that own Toyotas have a, have a pretty frequent trade cycle. They're going to trade out of their car every couple of years, except for those of us that keep them for 10 and 15 years. But there's a, there's a greater dependability behind it, right? If you're trying to navigate rebuilding your situation, it makes more sense to have something that you know that if you can get into it, you can drive it, you can get it paid off. It's going to get you where you need to be when you need to be there. You're going to be comfortable. You're going to have all the creatures comforts and cup holders and, and Apple CarPlay and everything else that you need to have, but you can literally drive a Toyota. There's, there's Toyotas that have been in the news for hitting a million miles. What better situation to put yourself in so that you can kind of re-divert those funds to getting your credit straightened out? I think that one of the most satisfying parts of my job in finance is having a customer that came into my office and maybe wasn't in the best situation when we met, but when they come back in two years and they've kind of done some of the things that I've, I've pointed out to them to do, they're, they're in a completely different place, right? They come in, they're happy, they're excited to see us, they're not nervous, they're at ease, and they're able to buy what they wanted to buy in the first place and something that they deserve to have because they've worked so hard to get it and it's the most satisfying thing ever. Now. Don't get me wrong, we are not financial advisors, but it's our job to be a liaison between you and these lending institutions in order to get you the most beneficial terms, if you will, something that's going to make sense for you and for your family and for what your lifestyle is. Because ideally, the whole purpose of buying a car is to have you get to your job, be able to take your kids to soccer practice or whatever it is that you need to do, and to be able to not have to worry about unexpected expenses. And and so our job here is just, just kind of set you up for the best case scenario. I hate to set people up for failure. I almost refuse to do it. And if I think that you are trying to buy something that you simply cannot afford to own, I'm going to tell you, I think that most of the people in this business, if you're dealing with a reputable dealership, are going to tell you, hey, look, I really want to sell you this car. But especially if you're if you're credit challenged to begin with, we're just setting you up for more failure. You're not going to be able to maintain this long term. And if, if something happens, what are you realistically going to do about it? I want to have a customer for life. I know that Toyota of Cool Springs wants to have a customer for life. We want you to come back over and over and over. Recommend all your friends and family to us because the majority of our business is referral business in the first place. And 
we can't consciously say that you're going to want to come back and do business with us if we put you into something knowing you can't afford it just because it's what you wanted to have. At, at the end of the day, my job as a finance manager here is to help you navigate buying a car with agreeable circumstances and, and, and payments that you can afford to help you protect your investment and to do it confidently and without the fear of rejection and uncertainty of not knowing whether or not you're even going to be able to leave with a car. Obviously, we're not credit counselors and we don't offer real financial advice, but that's what we're here to do at the end of the day is just to make sure that you understand the process and that you're better equipped to go on about it and give you the options that are available to you so that you can make the best decision for your situation. We know that these are very complex and difficult decisions to make and buying a car next to buying a house is one of the biggest purchases you're ever going to make. So if you feel like this video was for you and you feel like this is your situation and you have questions about what your situation is and you're not really sure, you know, as I always tell you guys, reach out to us. Our phone number is available online. Most of our email addresses are available online. I am always here to answer questions and we encourage you to do that. Pick up the phone, reach out to one of our salespeople online, let them know what your situation is. There's a high probability that they're going to come to me and that they're going to ask me to take a look at it. And then we're going to get on the phone and we're going to discuss it. I want to make sure that at the end of the day, you are 100% comfortable walking into this dealership or any dealership for that matter, knowing that you're going to be able to leave with a vehicle, something that's going to be reliable and something that you're going to be able to afford so that we don't continue to piggyback on bad habits and that we move you forward into the next season of your life in a much better situation than the one that you walked in here in. So I appreciate you tuning in. I hope that you learned something that was valuable today. As always, we are right here at Toyota of Cool Springs 1875 West McEwen in the heart of Franklin, Tennessee. We look forward to seeing you until next time. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Auto Advice Podcast. If you found this episode helpful, please consider texting it to someone who could use it and leave a review wherever you're listening, which will allow us to help more people navigate the ever-changing automotive world. The Auto Advice Podcast provides advice and opinions from individuals featured on the show. It is important to note that these opinions are solely those of the individuals and do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Toyota of Cool Springs. Listeners should exercise their own judgment and discretion when considering and implementing any advice or information provided in the podcast. Toyota of Cool Springs assumes no responsibility for any actions taken by individuals based on the information or opinions shared in this episode. Please consult with professionals or experts in the respective fields for specific advice or guidance related to your particular situation. Again, thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time on the Auto Advice Podcast.